everyone. Hi, welcome to Occupational Therapy 226. This is the third of three conditions lectures. So we're in the home stretch, both you and me both, me recording, you listening. Uh, this lecture is on neurodevelopmental disorders. There are a range of those. And my name is Melissa Kay. Let's go ahead and get started. This video uh, lecture has two parts. So we're in the third of three conditions lectures, and we're in part one of two of this lecture. We have a couple objectives. First is to identify the common features in uh, common neurodevelopmental conditions that are seen in pediatric OT. So there are others, but I'm going to go over the ones that we see frequently. And then the second is to describe the role of OT with these diagnostic conditions. First up is autism spectrum disorder. Uh, this is uh, very frequently encountered in pediatric OT. When I graduated back in the dark ages from San Jose State, uh, I, I got a job in a private practice and um, one entire day of my, my work world was all nonverbal children with autism. And then other days I had kids with um, more high functioning autism, but uh, every day. And in my practice now at Firefly Center, we see a lot of children that are on the autism spectrum. Uh, this is a picture of Temple Grandin, who is a, a person uh, with autism who is uh, quite renowned. She's got her PhD in animal science and she designs um, cattle runs and slaughterhouses that to be humane um, because she can see uh, with the perspective of the cattle. Um, so she's pretty awesome. You've probably heard of her. If you haven't, you should. Uh, and just a word about language. So, you know, when I was coming up, we would talk about um, a person with autism or a person with Down syndrome, uh, and a, a variety of um, a variety of folks with particular disabilities have reclaimed language, and so um, some uh, individuals who have this condition. Uh, refer to themselves as autistics. Rather than a person first language, they are autistics. So they're claiming that language. Um, I'll probably go both ways. It uh, is not a uh, any kind of indication of my respect or decision-making power about language, um, just that I'm used to saying person with, and um, not everybody wants to um, be referred to as autistic. All right, that was long-winded. Uh, so we're in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, fifth edition. So all of the criteria will be coming from, uh, from that source. With autis uh, um, autism spectrum disorder, um, there are some key criteria. So there are chronic social communication and interaction deficits. There's restricted repetitive patterns of behavior and in interests. The um, ASD is symptomatic in early development, so before three years of age, and there's significant social and occupational impairment. We also have a part that is a differential diagnosis, right? So what separates this from other disorders? And with the um, DSM disorders, Many, many of them have a differential component so that we sort out, is this disorder arising from this condition or that condition? Because the signs and symptoms can look similar. All right, so digging in just a little bit, and please check out the um, presenter notes section. It'll give you more information. I'm doing the high-level overview, and for those of you that have or will be working with individuals with autism, um, I, I strongly urge you to um, dig into the disorder more than I will be doing today. So criteria A, um, social communication and interaction is impaired. There's deficits in social emotional reciprocity, so the give and take of social interaction. Deficits in nonverbal communication, in other words, not being able to read body language or facial expression. 
um, effectively, and deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. Now, we used to think that uh, individuals with autism didn't want to interact or uh, didn't understand that interacting was important. That is very much not the case, but there's a great deal of inability to understand the how to interact. And as you know, you know, when you, uh, when you, meaning any of us, have developed um, a set of social skills by middle childhood, we're pretty sophisticated in using them. And so to fall behind during childhood means that, um, you know, there's these deficits and, um, and lack, of, lack of sophistication and skill. I feel like I'm talking a lot because I, uh, I've studied autism extensively. I've taught courses on it. Um, I see a lot of kids with autism, so I'll try not to try not to run off at the mouth. Uh, criteria B: restricted, repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, or activities. So this could be stereotyped movements or speech, like tick-like behavior or um, echolalia, which is repeating what someone else has said. It can be an insistence on sameness or uh, inflexibility or a rigidity around routines, rituals, or habits, right? So the realm of OT. Um, restricted or fixated interests. I've had kids who were um, fixated on World War II, on stereo systems, on um, cars and brands of cars and the logos on those cars, uh, ancient Egypt, um, what else? A range of a range of things, and so I've become um, something of an expert on a range of, of topics that are of interest to um, to a variety of people. Um, and I would also say, you know, when someone has autism and the the general public are not interested in these interests, we call it um, uh, maladaptive. But if it's a if it's a fixated interest on something that everybody is fixated on, like um, Giants baseball, as we're coming into the um, into the playoffs of the World Series, we look at it differently. So it is definitely uh, something that interferes with function. However, I'll probably be bringing your attention uh, a, a little bit to the fact that um, we can look at all of this as uh, a set of deficits, but we can also look at it um, when we're working with someone with autism or an autistic person as an opportunity to build on their strengths and to really use those strengths. So um, having really deep interests can be a strength, right? Especially when it's like coding, um, the ability to see patterns, things like that. So finally, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input. Now this is new in the DSM-5, which has now been out for a while, but it's the first time. And sensory processing and integration is right up our alley of OT. So this is a very, very awesome inclusion for us as therapists to be recognized um, I mean, they didn't do it for us, but to have this aspect of autism recognized and noted. We used to have uh, different types of autism, like autism, Asperger syndrome, child disintegrative disorder, Rett syndrome, things like that. In the DSM-5, they got rid of all of those uh, designators and uh, PDD-NOS. Um, and what we have now is levels of severity of autism, and these are part of when uh, someone gets diagnosed, they have, um, they have these levels associated with their diagnosis. So one is requiring support, two, substantial support, and three, very substantial report, uh, support needed. Um, and it's in the areas of social communication and restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. Um, this is slide eight, and you can please go back and look into this at your, um, at your convenience. Uh, CDC prevalence of autism, or ASD, in 2021. This is really, really startling. When I started my career 20 plus years ago, it was about one in a thousand kids. It creeped up, creeped up, creeped up. Now, one in 44. That's huge, especially when you think that, um, you know, someone with CP is one in a thousand. 
Um, for uh, a 30 year old mom, Down syndrome is one in a thousand, so one in 44. The ratio is four to one males. It affects all races and ethnicities, and it affects all socioeconomic groups. Now we look at what the treatment options are for individuals with ASD or autistics. There are a wide range, and if there was a cookbook or a magic pill, um, that would be great, but there isn't. So here's a range of uh, a range of the options, and um, and you will see a, a great combination of these. So uh, be it is first of all dependent on the severity and the manifestations of autism. So some people would say that um, there are autisms, plural, because every individual who is autistic has a really different presentation. So that's first and foremost that we want to attend to how is the autism manifesting? Is it a problem? And on a continuum of things that are problematic, how problematic is it? There are behavior and communication therapies. Many of you have heard of uh, applied behavioral analysis, which is a behavioral therapy, and also uh, communication ther therapies, including speech and language pathology. There are many different kinds of educational and, uh, and learning therapies, as well as uh, early intervention being very key. So if we think that the individual with autism is going to manifest by three years of age, and, and a lot of times we can see as early as six to nine months that that child is, um, is potentially has autism, we want to start intervening early. That's very crucial. There's also a range of family therapies. Um, both more behavioral and more in, engaged and um, social emotional and uh, yeah, so a variety. Um, and we don't, we're not going to get into details with any of this, but as I said, um, you know, I've been studying autism for a long time. So if you have questions, please, please, please bring them to my attention. Okay. OT. And within OT, there's a range of approaches. Um, there's sensory integration and sensory processing therapy to address some of the self-regulation issues, the um, uh, hyper and hypo responsiveness to sensation, the modulation of sensation. And we'll get into that later in the semester, but that is definitely a piece of things. Um, there is uh, DIR floor time, which there's a lecture later in the semester about that as well, but it's a way of uh, building rapport and trust and partnering with the child to, um, to build skills. Um, straight up motor skills work um, because praxis, praxis issues can be um, present in autism. Uh, social skills work, especially in groups. Um, and then um, there's a range of other therapies as well, including medications, dietary changes. Um, some folks would say that um, preservatives and sugars and things like that will worsen autism and the symptoms of it. And then also alternative health care. So acupuncture has had some good success in treating autism. Um, and a variety of other like supplement-based kinds of things. Now, uh, families will come to us and say, well, what do you think about X, right? And it's the newest, latest, greatest of um, alternative approaches to, uh, to working on some of the symptoms of autism. And what I have to say about that is that we want to, first of all, be sure that the treatment is safe, right? So that's first and foremost. If it's unsafe and we have that information, we need to share it. If it is something that is safe to try, then I present it like that, you know, that they, that the family is actually in charge and um, they need to be aware of the potential benefits, the potential risks, and the fact that nothing might happen. And it could be just a little bit of a time investment or a very substantial time investment. And so we weigh it in terms of all of those factors. So um, that's a start on the treatment options uh, for uh, autistic people. And we can dig more into this in class. 
Here is a, a prep question for class again, and you probably used to me saying this at this point. Uh, there's no place for you to record your answer, but I would like you to think about it, jot down some notes, bring them to class, because you will be expected to participate in a discussion. So uh, here's the question. How might inflexible routines affect a five-year-old child with ASD who is enrolled in an OT play group? So we can say that that play group has three children in it. So how does the inflexibility or the rigidity affect that five-year-old? So you're going to have to think about what is a five-year-old supposed to be able to do? What is the inflexibility effect? And how do those combine when we're working on social skills and um, functional communication? The second question is how might sensory reactivity affect a 12-year-old with ASD in their social engagement? Okay, so different aspects of autism, different ages, um, different uh, demands being placed on the child. So have a thought about that and I'm going to go ahead and move on. Now we're going to look at ADD and ADHD, which stands for Attention Deficit Disorder and Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So two different types, one that has hyperactivity or this, this very high level of uh, energy and sort of frenetic activity. So our DSM criteria for ADHD there's a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity or impulsivity. Um, so let me just change this up. Oops. They differentiate whether or not there's hyperactivity and impulsivity. Both types have attention issues. There uh, must be at least six attention and six hyperactivity symptoms with ADHD. It needs to be present by 12 years of age present in two or more settings. So that brings environment into it, which um, OTs are well versed in and how different environments impact our clients in different ways. The symptoms impact social, academic, or occupational functioning. So again, this DSM-5 has evolved to really include things that are central to our scope of practice, in this case, occupational functioning. There are, again, differential diagnoses and specifiers in terms of severity, remission, and type. Digging into the signs and symptoms, there's inattention and distractibility in both types. There may be impulsivity and hyperactivity. Um, so impulsivity can be, uh, I, I have to reach out and, and grab whatever it is that's on the um, desk in front of me. It could be, I have to jump off this roof of my garage, uh, a variety of, um, a variety of behaviors. Hyperactivity is the inability to self-regulate so that one can attend and, um, and remain focused on an activity during the, the whole span of that activity. And this, of course, is especially difficult when the activity is not a preferred one. Um, think school stuff. There's difficulty with organization, and these are a little bit, you know, not in the not in the name of the disorder, but these are also hallmarks. So difficulty with organization of self and belongings and time, low frustration tolerance, either bossiness or forgetfulness. So some are want to tell everybody else what to do. Other um, folks with ADHD or ADD are very forgetful and they can't keep things in their brain. There's increased risk-taking behavior. Um, you know, my example was jumping off the roof. There's a lot of different stuff depending on the age and stage that um, an individual with ADHD is in. They may make careless mistakes, not paying attention, right? And there's poor follow-through on tasks. Um, this is the most commonly diagnosed neural behavioral disorder. Uh, three to five percent of the population may have it. It occurs more in boys. There is a genetic link, so um, runs through families. We see that. Uh, there's a neurochemical basis as well. And the primary intervention strategies are um, pharmacological in terms of uh, giving stimulants like Ritalin to kids with ADHD um, and also behavioral interventions. So rein it in. 
Um, it's characterized by a lack of inhibition and poor working memory as well. We're now going to turn to Intellectual Development Disorder, or IDD. Um, so for uh, the general public, um, we have an IQ, right, or an intelligence quotient. And it's considered um, in school-based practice um, to be between 85 and 115 points. When we focus on in, uh, instruction, it's between 90 and 110. That's considered the average range. Um, we then look at um, a test of intelligence. The most common one is the Weschler Intelligence Scale for Children. And it's divided into verbal comprehension, perceptual reasoning, working memory, and processing speed. So four different areas of, um, of quote unquote intelligence or cognitive skill. When we think about uh, the, the diagnostic criteria for IDD, there's deficits in intellectual functions, thus the name. There's deficits in adaptive functioning that limits independence. So it's not only in school, you're not quite catching on, it's also in the world, adaptive functioning is impaired due to this cognitive deficit. And it limits the, the person's ability to be out on their own, to go and take the bus, to get a job and be in uh, an environment where there's not direct support, to go to school on your own, etc. The onset is anytime is during the developmental period, and um, and many um, kids are born with an intellectual disability that may or may not be associated with another disorder. Remember back when we were talking about the different genetic disorders and um, Down syndrome is associated with intellectual disability, so is Prader-Willi syndrome. So it can be on its own, or it can be with other disorders. We specify the severity according to the DSM-5 into mild, moderate, severe, or profound. Here is uh, a bell curve that shows I IQ score distribution. And we can see that between 85 and 115, 68% of the population falls into that category. Um, when you look at the light blue areas where it says 2%, we're going to look on the left side because um, we're not really interested in those with high IQs for um, the purposes of this presentation. Um, so between 55 and 70, 2% um, of the population, and then below 55 is 0.1% of the population. So you can see that um, the mild moderate is going to make up a greater percentage, but we also see um, children with severe or profound intellectual disability. All right, uh, we've reached the end of part one, so I will come back and, whoops, I'm giving you a preview. I will come back very shortly with part two of two of this third conditions lecture. See you real soon.